Welcome back to Project Greepix. In order to weld this front, we need a sandblaster. So I'll just press on with that. I gotta get this plate welded on properly. And the best way to start is with a sandblaster. It's been a huge job and we've got to get the last of the plates on next week. So Dame's finishing off this plate this week. He's got a sandblast, make sure the surface is ready for welding. And then he does a lot of welding. And I mean a lot. With little money, lots of support, Kiwi ingenuity and good old blood, sweat and tears, we're creating a community expedition and research boat built and run by volunteers from around the world because life is too short not to fight for your dream. I took a stroll downtown this evening When I heard music echo through the night The same old songs that I heard the night before So I started running so I wouldn't be too late Right at the very top of the new panel on the original hull is like essentially paint so I need to take all of that paint off because I want to have two shiny beautiful pieces of steel one side's obviously painted that's not going to do so in order to be able to get a clean weld I've got to get rid of the paint it's pretty slow going with the sandblaster um, my Wii compressor just doesn't have the horsepower of the big one so it takes a long time to get anywhere with this thing especially dry blasting um, so I'm going to needle gun the paint off and then I will get in there and clean what's left up with the sandblaster Okay, scratch that. I'm not doing it with a needle gun. That there is what I'm trying to create. I know it's very difficult to see, but I've basically taken the paint back from the join, so I can now sandblast that and get a nice two lots of clean white metal so we can weld really well there. In other news these areas here came up really well so what that allows me to do is get a really lovely weld all the way down with no rust on either plate. Knowing that I was going to be sandblasting this before I weld the inside that's partly why I wasn't too worried about it being sitting there rusting and, and what have you. The metal's not going to lose enough thickness in the couple of weeks or whatever it's been for it to be, it's completely inconsequential the amount of rust that will actually take metal off. Um, but in terms of welding it does affect it so that's why you have to get it down to either grind it down to white metal or sandblast it. In this case I'm sandblasting because you just can't get into a lot of the corners with a grinder so it's easier just to get in there and fire the blaster at it and get a nice clean surface ready to go. Let me show you what I've been trying to create. You can see that clean white line down the edge of that bulkhead. I've been trying to create that over basically all of the welding surfaces. So you can sort of see as you work your way down, it's a bit hard with the light, but right inside you can sort of see up there as well. And then right the way around that join, may not necessarily show up on camera, but right the way around that plate is now blasted all the way down. And there's a couple of spots I've yet to do with the blaster. We're struggling with air pressure basically, but we're very much getting there. I know some of you are going to say, but I didn't think you were allowed to sandblast in the yard. And technically that was true, how we were used to sandblast. We used to wet blast, and the issue was the rules changed around the water and it dropping on the ground and they're, they're theoretically being able to get to the sea. It can't, there's sumps in this yard, so it's impossible for that water to make it to the sea because it gets pulled out of the ground before then. However, the EPA said no wet blasting. Alright cool, so we've found another way. We are allowed to spot blast with dry blasting because it comes out as sand, it doesn't come out as like a slurry. Um, and 
we are allowed to sandblast if we're inside the boat. I mean, technically this, this is inside the boat, right? While the blast is out and running, another job I need to do is strip the paint off the forward bulkhead on the front fuel tanks. So you can see the pitting is covered up by a coating of paint. I need to get that off so I can make a good judgement as to what we need to do to repair it. And sandblasting is the best method to use as it gets into every little pore, nook and cranny that the steel has. Because I want this to be a repair for life, I'm ripping into this, um, the pitting and stuff that's over here. And there's something that I want to show you, pitting. The straight edge there, you can sort of see there's maybe 5 mil in this area here, there's maybe 5 mil down. So there's a lot of material that's gone. I need to build that back up. Same deal over there, there's sort of a deep pit through there. And then over there, there's a few over that way. And that translates basically to the waterline of the original uh, concrete that was in this area. So it's attacked that bulkhead as well as the, the two hull panels that's attacked that bulkhead. So I need to fix that. Now I'm going to pad weld this. I'm not going to replace the steel. There's no need to. But I do need to get all of the crud and rust and things like that out of every single dimple so that I get a really good um, weld when I do the pad welding. But one of the reasons why I wanted to sandblast it was because of this black piece right here. That's the culprit right there. So you can see this lump of black stuff that's basically rust sitting in a dimple so if I was to leave that I have no idea how deep that dimple goes down so I need to get in there with a needle gun and bash that out and then carry on sandblasting till I get to the bottom and it's possible that I might end up going through into the fuel tank I don't think I will but it is possible and it doesn't matter I've still got to do it because if I don't do it now it's almost impossible to fix this without having to rip the whole front end apart again that's what's left after I've needle gun that black spot out it's pretty deep but it's not as bad as I thought. It's definitely fixable with some pad welding. So I'll get in there with a the sandblaster now and rip out any of that last little black gunk, the rust that's stuck in those pores, um, and then get it back to a nice white metal state so that we can fill it up with some weld. I've run out of garnet, but I think I've revealed enough to know where to fix. There's a pinhole there. It's not huge, but I'll, I'll pad weld that up. But you can sort of see over in this area here, there's a lot of dimples and a lot of low spots. I will try and get a bit more garnet because I would like to extend this up. There's a spot there I want to investigate. Uh, a wee bit of rust there and then, yeah, just, just generally just above that line. I just It's annoying I run out there, but down here is pretty good. Um, I've ground into it to weld onto it and there's nothing really that's dramatic down there. I'm not too worried about that. Again, much like up here, underneath the cement was pretty good. Um, but above the cement on that waterline was garbage and that's exactly where we're seeing that pitting there. So I need to get in, a bit more garnet, and I'll get some more blasting done on that before I can pad weld that up. It's last thing in the day and the wind is slightly higher than I'd like to do the finishing welds on this. So um, I'm going to set everything up and then I'll probably weld it first thing in the morning. It's generally a bit lower winds first thing in the morning here. Um, don't hold me to that, it's almost certainly going to be 25 knots now that I've said that. But yeah, I want to get that inside welded up and then I'll do a decent grind from the outside and then start doing the capping weld on the outside. Thanks Woody Woodman for encouraging us to put together a Amazon wish list with a fair bit of persistence on my ad, which was really great. It blows us away how generous you guys are, our online global community. Um, whether it's supporting our sponsors or it's um, joining us on Patreon, donating parts or expertise or subscribing it's just amazing guys we realized early on creating a channel and project like this meant we could lose a lot of our privacy and potentially our online security we're both shy ironically and we like our privacy and if we could we would be off grid but to live a life we love and build a project that's inspiring we decided it was worth getting out of our comfort zone getting involved and be part of the global online community with all the risks that's involved to deal with some of these issues we've gone for the best security we can to keep us and project brewpeg safe it's been worth it and companies like nordpass have made it possible our world and project is built around youtube so one of the biggest potential risks is our password security. We have quite a few and we're a channel and project that is very public. So we have to be careful that we don't get hacked and that our private information stays private while we're being very public. We have multiple experts and volunteers involved and soon groups and researchers. So we have to have a secure online presence for everything we do. Right now we're creating an Amazon wish list suggested by you guys for a very long time. We've been concerned about adding another security risk and we always forget our passwords. So we've been putting it off. NordPass is simple. It's a password manager that stores multiple passwords and enables everything to be secured by a master password so you only have to remember that one. It's encrypted by XCharchar20 which is one of the most secure forms of encryption algorithm available. It uses multi-factor authentication and biometric log security. 
It's important to us that it works. NordPass helps you create complicated passwords as well. And the more complicated the password, the higher the security. And no Britain, Arsenal is not a secure password. Hackers can guess a simple password like your name or 12345678 but something complicated like capital X 1WNP 7.EI is pretty hard to guess and it's much safer. With one master password to rule them all, safeguarding your individual passwords that are encrypted and really hard to guess, you have serious security that's easy to remember. Not even NordPass know your master password, we really like that. NordPass also autofills website logins so it's faster, there's unlimited password storage, secure cloud storage and they have data breach monitoring. You can find if your login or credit card information has been leaked, where it's been leaked, when and what type of data was compromised. This is the first release into the wild of our Amazon Ultra Hyper Mega Secure Wishlist. Thank you for everyone who encouraged us to do it. Thank you NordPass for keeping us safe and snug. If you'd like to get an exclusive NordPass deal plus one additional month free, click the link in the description or use the code Project Brewpeg at the checkout. This is risk free with a 30 day money back guarantee. I spoke to Tony, the sandblaster in the yard, and I managed to get some more garnet. So um, I've got, there's four bags sitting there, but I've got six bags in total. Um, and I actually don't know how much the tank takes. I think it probably takes maybe all six actually, maybe even more to fill it fully, but we've got enough garnet to get the job done now. I've also got the guys bringing over a couple more A-frames so I can make a welding windshield. the top of doom it's very much a dead zone in here which is perfect so we can get in and start mig welding uh, I do have sand to carry on blasting but I might leave that for a bit I might actually just get this welding done while I have wind that's low um, and then as soon as that starts getting up which it surely will today I'll press on and get a bit more blasting done Just ran out of wire, but I managed to get sort of up that back side. Haven't got across the top, but I started about there somewhere. You can sort of see the weld continues and then goes right the way up the front. And then I got a few vertical ups on the ribs. Ran out of wire here at the shop and get some more. And there's a certification that I need on every piece of welding wire that we use on the boat. I'll show you what it is. This is a brand of welding wire. And you can see the approvals down here. LR, BVQI, DNV, GL, ABS. That's Lloyd's Register, can't remember what that one is, DNV, can't remember what the other two is, but basically what that means is it's approved for use in shipbuilding. Those companies are the um, companies that, that certify ships, so the, the register that do like, you know, Lloyd certification and things like that. If you don't use the right wire, you can't then therefore have your welds, you know, be approved, and therefore you can't get insurance on your big ships. So if you are doing shipbuilding, look for those sorts of things and you know you've got really good quality wire. A trick when MIG welding in a dirty environment like this is keeping your wire as clean as pos. I use a foam earplug. And then as it feeds through, it'll just sit there the whole time and basically wipe the wire. So you don't end up with any sort of rubbish traveling down your liner. It just makes your liner last a little bit longer.
Okay, I've got a weld basically around the perimeter of that plate, right the way on the inside there, all the way down. You can sort of see the weld just tucking in there. And then there's a stack of vertical ups on each rib bulkhead so that we can get those tied to the plate. And then all of the stringers as well have got a, at least one weld on them. So that's plenty for those. They're quite short anyway, so that should be a pretty darn rigid plate now. Um, yeah, I'm pretty chuffed with that. On the other side, you can just sort of see how many welds are holding that plate in. So there's an absolute bucket load of welds holding that together now. Um, now, there is a couple of things I want to do. I'm going to change the way that I'm prepping this weld all the way around the perimeter of this plate here. I'm going to basically V it out really deeply with my uh, grinder and then I'm going to do a fairly deep capping weld on this side. So um, it's going to be a much slower weld, but it'll be a much, much stronger and deeper penetrating weld. You can also see that dog that's welded on there. I just I put that on actually just before because there was quite a bow in that original hull plate that I've managed to take out. So I've sort of made the hull a bit fairer, um, which is always a nice thing. This is the internal weld on looking at it from the outside. If I zoom right in, you should be able to see, there we go, you can see the internal weld just poking through on this side. Now I need to clean that up, I can't weld straight onto that, so you get your grinder, turn it on its edge, and then you can sort of see the wear on this grinding disc. They round over on the edge here, like, see if I can hold this. So they round over on this edge here, it's never really a square edge when it's a worn disc, and you can literally put it end on into your weld, so you just you know, dig the blade straight into the weld and then you end up with a nice groove to weld into and work your way around all of the original tack welds that we put in as well as the V'd out plate and you essentially you want to dig a groove so you can see here the grinder is end onto the, the weld line and I'm just cutting out any porosity, any um, imperfections, any mismatches essentially I want clean steel to weld over top and I'm putting one big heavy hot cap weld over top of all of this so this is my welding prep, this is the most important part of plate repair Right, that is well prepped. Let me show you. As you look along there, you can see it's basically V'd out and there's no like punctures through into the hull. As you come down, it's the same sort of deal all the way down. So that profile follows right the way around this plate. Right down the stem here, you can see that I've gone through, like this one here is a well that I've cleaned off. I've basically rounded them back into themselves. There's another one just there. You can see they sort of if I hold on that for a bit, you can see it's it's a bit hard to tell from this angle. You sort of look down along the length of the weld, you can see that it's rounded into itself. All the way down. The point of doing that, rounding those welds right out, it basically allows you to get the, the wire, when you're welding, it allows you to get the wire right into that root, so you're not basically driving over top of a, of a pre-existing weld. You've essentially ground it out. So yes, it's still there, it's still holding some tension, etc., but it's not it's not so pronounced that it's going to cause an issue. So what my ideal situation is, is to run a single bead from the bottom of the plate all the way to the top in one go and hopefully have no stops. Probably not going to get that, but that, that's the ideal, that's what you aim for. Um, having these lumps and bumps, if you don't grind them out, you end up with a really manky looking 
weld. If you grind them out like this, you can drive straight over the top of them and you don't see them and they don't cause any imperfections or issues with your um, capping weld. And grinding that profile into the actual um, weld that you've already done allows exactly the same thing. Basically, you can do those little triangle patterns and you can drive right into the root of that joint and then you can make sure that you get absolute full penetration all the way through that weld. It's getting late in the day, so rather than start that capping weld, which is probably one of the most critical welds on the boat, late in the day when I'm tired, I'm going to just stop now. It's all prepped, ready to go. I'm going to jump over onto the sandblaster and clean up that front bulkhead of the uh, fuel tanks and get it ready so that we can start pad welding tomorrow morning when I'm fresh and we're good to go. Alright, so this is what we're working with in terms of pitting and the need to pad weld. So right up close you can sort of see there is pitting and dimples and things like that. But, it's actually not that bad. That table will be filled up with the welder pretty easily. So, the light's going to exaggerate it. But you can kind of see, there's quite a gap behind that straight edge all the way along. And it's pretty much where we suspected it would be where that water line is. That's probably the worst bit right there. You can see there's kind of a tall bit. And then it's sort of worse its way along. Also, up the top here, there's a sort of a few pits that are reasonably deep we need to deal with. Given that we've been able to take all of the rubbish off that pitted area, it's worth getting in there now and pad welding. We can just basically get the MIG welder and, and start you know, weaving a pattern right over. So quite a big wide pattern, we'll just, you know, essentially knitting. You basically just run beads back and forth, back and forth, and you build that thickness back up. Now, why would you do that versus cut it out and put a plate in? So cut it out and put a plate in is definitely an option, but if you can get away with pad welding, it's generally faster. Um, and one of the things to factor in is that this replacing a plate in this area of the boat is an absolute nightmare because you've got two fuel tanks, one on either side, so a, a port and a starboard fuel tank, and you've got a, a, um, a steel bulkhead all the way down the centre line that separates the two, two of them apart. So in order to cut this plate out, you've got to do a huge amount of unpicking inside each fuel tank, which is probably the hardest part of the boat to work in because you're very deep sort of V confined space like it's just everything about it is difficult really hard to get your hands in there and, and actually you know grind it out and do a good job of it so even though it's probably much slower overall you know normally to pad weld versus say cut a plate cut it out put a plate in in this case it's actually faster because of just how hard it would be to put a plate in now some people would say you can weld a pad over top of it so weld a plate over top of the corrosion absolutely don't do that it's a terrible terrible idea the reason being is because if you get rust between those plates you ba basically you haven't stopped the rust you haven't stopped the problem in the in the, the back plate in the first place and you're just pretty much hiding it um, and it will fail on you so if you get a pinhole in your weld which you absolutely certainly will because you can't pressure test it and there's a whole bunch of stuff around it, it it's 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 just a bad bad idea never never do it if you can you know have any other option to not do that um, that's why on commercial boats they always cut out and put plates whenever they have to do something you know like this sort of repair or they pad weld as opposed to weld a plate on top of it. It's the absolute crack of dawn, well zero hour, 9am. So time to get this welded up, there's not a lot of wind so I want to get it done first thing. Put the tent of doom up and you kind of see I've made it as tight as I can possibly get it to the hull. It's not perfect down this end could certainly do with a lot more protection but I think it's as good as we're probably going to get for the minute. I don't want to take any chances with this weld, it's really critical so dress for the weld that you want, that's why we're wearing a pink business shirt today. I apologise for the right up in your face camera angle but you're right with me inside the wind barrier. Um, I'm going to start on this back edge, I'm going to start my way basically just anywhere in the clear here and just start working my way up. The reason I want to do that is because when I go to restart and get this grind area here, I want to be able to grind out. I don't want it to be in a corner. It should never start in a corner if you can help it. So um, it gives me the easiest access to be able to get in there and get a really good clean weld. It was about here I realised that something's definitely not right with this squirt gun and the guy that's holding it. Let's start all that again. There's no point in trying to rescue a crap weld, just grind it out and start again. Be fearless, no one can hear us. You're throwing the pillars through the fog. 
what, was, what was happening, I think my settings were wrong because I was getting a lot of undercut, I was also getting a really heaped up weld profile, starting to look garbage and I just knew it wasn't going to be a good weld so I've just cut everything I did out, I've just cut it all out and I'll start again and yeah, reset the machine, I'll probably get a bit of scrap and start mucking around with it and figure out what's going on and then once that's dialed in, then I'll start welding the plate. On today's episode of Man vs Weld, we've got vertical up. I finally figured out what was going on with the welder. Ran out of gas, voltage was wrong, technique was wrong. So that's awesome, got that fixed, we're good to go. I started off using solid wire on the MIG, but I found even in the very slight breeze that I had skimming down the side of the boat, I was still getting spots of porosity coming through. So I ground the solid core welds back out, and I swapped over to a dual shield wire so that I have a bit better control in the breeze with that porosity issue. Every time I stop welding I need to clean the flux off and then grind the end of the weld I've just put in so that I can make a new start and get a nice burn in and there's no porosity or pinholes. I've gone through and I've got a weld around the perimeter of this plate. What I want to do now, I'm not 100% certain if I've got an absolute perfect weld all the way around. So I've been welding with flux core so that I can deal with the wind. Essentially I don't want any porosity if I find any pinholes or find any areas where I'm not happy about the fusion. I need to go through and grind it out and, and just do another weld over top of all of that. So in order to check how good my welding is, I'm going to go around with a little buffing wheel and just buff off the flux, get right back down to straight metal and you see exactly how well I did. As you'd expect, some welds are good, some are absolute garbage. So there's one that I'm sort of happy with. You've got a nice consistent pattern. Another one up there that's pretty good. Let's find some that are garbage. Look at this. What a dog's breakfast. 
So I'll grind that out, start again. Down here I'm not happy with this bottom corner. Need to deal with that. So I'll grind that out, start again on that. Uh, up here, not super happy with that one right there. Let's see if we can get El Camera to focus. Come on, you can do it. I can't show you. Right up in this area here, it's basically not fused. And there's a couple of spots as we get higher that I need to do a bit more work. But probably 99% of that is good. I just need a couple of cleanups. All right, I've gone around and there's actually a few areas I've tidied up with the TIG. So I've pulled the weld out and then dug right back in with the TIG so you can kind of see it's come up quite clean. There's still a lot of MIG left in this, um, but yeah, just one or two areas where I've gone around and basically given it a whiz up right down there, dug that out and then gave that a whiz up with TIG as well. So pretty chuffed with all of it now. I can't believe it, this side's finished. Time to move on. And a little sneak peek of what we got coming up next week. I feel like this is a glitch in the matrix. We've we've definitely been here before.